Thank you everyone for being here. I'm gonna walk around, so I'm gonna to try to talk loud enough to where everyone can hear. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the role of remnant native vegetation and land management practices uh, when it comes to the reclamation of specifically the little blue stem dominant prairies. So I'm probably preaching to the choir here, of course, um, but I'm, like he said, I'm from Fort Worth in the DFW area. And um, this is kind of how our prairie systems have gone over the past uh, 50 years or so. These are the ecoregions that are supposed to be there. So what it is is we've got Blackland Prairies near Dallas, and then we've got um, Fort Worth Prairie near Fort Worth, and then all around it is Cross Timbers region. And uh, from this map right here, this little black blot right here was what Fort Worth, the urban part of Fort Worth was in 1940. And all this around is the giant Fort Worth Prairie. Uh, but now, this is in the year 2000, and you can see all of this gray area, that's all the urban area. Here's Dallas, and here's Fort Worth. Um, and then a lot of the rest of it has been taken over by agriculture, of course. Mainly more in Dallas, because they have more fertile so soils in the Blackland Prairie region. Um, but of course, this, um, this great resource has been reduced a lot over the past, um, about probably about 200 years or so. So as we all know, um, these native prairie communities in the Fort Worth Prairie, they have a lot of different things. We've got forbs, we've got grasses, we've got cactuses and things like that. But what I'm primarily focusing on is little bluestem as a, uh, a prairie indicator. So um, that is the indicator species that I was looking at and its dominance in the prairie environment. So I wanted to look at kind of the different types of prairie reclamation and the different things that you can do and the pros and cons of those things. So there, there's passive reclamation where you're essentially just letting everything happen by itself, um, let things come back if they're there. Um, but it takes more time and you don't really have any control over what's happening. And then there's active restoration where you have to spend more effort, you have to spend more money, um, but you have more control over what, what happens and it might, you might be able to reduce the amount of time that you're taking to restore an area. So if you're here for the last talk, you heard a little bit about the Fort Worth Nature Center from Rob, um, but if not, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's a area in Fort Worth. It's a natural, um, like a natural park. It's right at the boundary between the Fort Worth Prairie and the Cross Timbers region, so it's kind of a mosaic. You've got large prairie patches, small prairie patches, and then um, wooded areas. And there's some of their adorable bison. So what happened was um, in the really early, like in the 19, uh, around 1920, they started acquiring all this land to make some lakes around this area. And so um, the Nature Center was part of some of the land that they acquired for that. And so they were building the lakes over these years. And then when it came to like the early 1970s is when all these um, Previous land uses that were going on at the Nature Center ceased to exist. It became the Nature Center. It became a city property. And um, so some of the things that happened before that disturbed some of these natural areas were farming, um, grazing, and quarrying. And that grazing was a lot of different things. They actually, I think, had like goat grazing previously along with cow grazing. Um, and a lot of these things, this was privately owned land before they owned it. So a lot of these things, they don't even know necessarily what happened to these areas. Um, but around 1970 is when all these disturbances ended and then um, the restoration process began. So I'm going to talk about some of my research sites that I have. This is an aerial map of the Fort Worth Nature Center. Um, these blue areas here are some of their prairie remnants that they have. And um, these areas have had little to no management over the past 45 years or so. These little stars that you see around um, are seed, seed rain mats that I placed out, but I won't be talking about that today because I don't really have time. Then this big red area up here that you can see at the top, that's the area that was quarried. So what it was is it was um, like surface mines. The city of Fort Worth was taking out gravel and sand and things like that to make all of our roads and stuff. So um, this is what some of the areas look like at the bottom. You can tell like here, this is just a gaping hole in the ground. This is what it looks like now after you know, they just removed everything and left the hole. And then um, here's kind of what it looks like while they're like, doing the prairie, I mean the, the quarrying and everything. So um, they, 
two of those prairie areas on my little map, these guys, and I named P1 and P2, they call them Farview Prairie and Little Farview Prairie, and that's kind of the Nature Center's pristine, nice prairies. That's their, um, their like happy target prairies. So that's what I chose as my target prairies. And I did that for a number of reasons. First of all is because the Nature Center likes those and um, they have a lot of great native species, but it's also because of this um, paper that I read that was from 1946 and it was talking about specifically the Fort Worth Prairie. And what he did was he went around in 1946 and looked at all these different areas that had been grazed and that hadn't been grazed. And he made this graph of um, kind of what the Fort Worth Prairie community will do um, when it's recovering from grazing. So you can see this line that goes up really steeply is little blue stem. So when you reach that climax, um, climax prairie community, you're having a very dominant little blue stem in this area. So that's another reason why I focus on um, little blue stem as my primary prairie indicator. So I have a few questions. I wanted to know um, how does the past land of uh, land use affect what's going on now in the prairie reclamation. Um, to what extent can the little uh, areas that are still remain um, affect the reclamation of those areas that were destroyed? And then um, how do the different management st strategies that the Forest Nature Center employed uh, affect the success of those native prairie areas? So, I did some community surveys just looking at the plants, of course. I looked at um, little blue stem, and then I looked at the amount of native plants that were there and the amount of invasive plants that were there, species richness, and then I looked at all these different land areas and compared them back to the, that remnant prairie, the nice um, target prairie or whatever. I also did some soil testing. So I did soil testing on those native target prairies, and then I also um, did them on some of the areas that were managed, and then some of the quarry fill that is going into the bottom of those quarries that they're filling. I did not do any microbial um, analysis. I only did texture and nutrients, although microbes are very important, of course, in soil. So first I want to talk about what happened with just the agricultural disturbances. So these are the areas <clears throat> that were either had like row crops in the past or grazing and things like that. So this graph right here to the left, we have the two areas, um, undisturbed areas, undisturbed areas. And then um, the cover proportion is this, oh, wrong way. Okay, this is the proportion of the cover <clears throat> and what I looked at was native species, invasive species, and then just bare ground and other, other is like standing dead or things like that. So what I found, also, okay, you can see these little stars. Those little stars just mean that there, there's actually a st statistic difference, a sig significant <coughs> difference between the things. So what you see is the disturbed areas have more invasive um, plants. So this is after 45 years of little to no management. So what happened 45 years ago, around 1970 or so, they stopped um, with all of their agricultural practices and there's been not much happening over the past uh, 45 years. So the native um, plants were able to come back, but some of those invasive plants are still around. Um, you, you definitely have more significant. But then when you look at little blue stem just alone, not native plants, you see that the little blue stem um, is way lower in the disturbed area. So you can see that although um, native plants in general were able to come back after 45 years, the little blue stem uh, is still taking a little bit more time to get back to those undisturbed um, proportions. So now I want to talk about specifically what happened with the quarry area. So what happened was these areas a long time ago, like I said, they, they just dug out um, all this gravel and stuff. These are surface. So there's just giant pits in the ground. And so what has happened is some areas have been completely disturbed. There are some little patches that have been left in this quarry area. Usually these are really small because what happened was is the quarry people, if they could get their big old trucks in it, they quarried it. So um, a lot of these remnant patches are really small. Um, but some areas ha were quarried a while ago and just left. No one's ever done anything with them. Um, at one point in time, around 35 years ago, one area had had some haphazard soil amendments added to it, and that included like bison manure and maybe some like commercially available fertilizer and things like that. Um, other areas have been filled 
with uh, soil that was gotten from the Fort Worth city, so um, kind of unknown origins. And then some areas have been filled and then seeded or planted with native plants. And I kind of have this little scheme here of um, how I'm describing them. So in P, those are those native prairies, the undisturbed areas. And then Q means it was quarried. Um, the dash, the number here is how many years ago the action happened. So that means it was quarried 45 years ago. This one, it was quarried 45 years ago, but 35 years ago there were soil amendments added. And so here this is, um, it was filled nine years ago, here filled three years ago, and these um, FS, FSP means filled, seeded, and planted. And this is just filled and seeded, and um, that's the amount of time that has elapsed since that management practice happened. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about all the, um, all those different um, management styles that I just described to you. So first I wanna start here. This one, um, it has a lot of bare ground, and that's because it was filled um, less than a year before I did this survey. But you can see that the species that had started to come in were mainly invasive. Um, and so what, what, what that was is that um, already Johnson grass had begun to grow in the, the, the pits. And then once they added the soil on top, the soil wasn't thick enough to where the Johnson grass didn't just pop right back through and just continue to grow through. So even though they're filling them, um, those invasive species are still um, pretty much thriving. Um, all these letters, if they're within the same letter, that means there is no significant difference between them. If they're different letters, that means they're different groups and there's a significant difference. So I want to talk about the, um, the native. The white down here is the native part. Here's what we're kind of comparing it to, these native prairies here, and this is the amount of native. Um, you can tell that it has a lot more of the other category. So that is like the standing dead, litter, things like that. So it's been established for longer, so it has more of that dead matter. Um, but when it comes to um, some of these areas, like here, that was quarried 35, or had soil amendments uh, added 35 years ago, um, there, its natives are actually higher than those, um, those native remnants. Um, when it comes to the areas that were quarried 45 years ago and have just been left as a pit in the ground, it's kind of comparable to the native prairies when it comes to the native species, but then there's also more uh, invasive species that have come into there. When you get down to these areas that nine years ago were filled and um, had some type of seeding or filled and had no seeding, you can tell that the seeding and planting did, um, did do a lot for the native community here. The areas that were just filled have the most invasive species. So these ones that were left here as kind of just a gaping hole in the ground over the past 45 years have fared slightly better when it comes to native species than some of these ones that were just recently filled. Um, and that's probably because some of the fill soil also had um, invasive propagules within it. So not only recreating that, recreating that disturbance to where these invasives can get in, but we're also adding more invasive propagules. So that was native plants, but when it comes to a little blue stem cover, you've got a pretty, um, pretty nice little um, timeline here. So the one that has the longest amount of time with no disturbance has the most little blue stem. And then as you go down in the amount of time since disturbance, you have less little blue stem cover. So um, while the native stuff was kind of affected a lot by the management strategies and things like that, it seems like the little blue stem was mainly just affected by the amount of time that has elapsed since it was disturbed. So now I'm gonna talk about the effectiveness of the seeding and planting that they did, um, because it, it was definitely effective. Um, these are the areas that were seeded and planted, and then the areas that were just seeded. It looks like there's not that much of a, um, a difference in the native cover in general, um, but you can see visually sort of a difference in, where, in when things were planted and when things were seeded. You can tell that some of the areas that were planted definitely have more mat mature plants, of course. Um, when you're growing a lot of things, like especially like little bluestem from seed, it takes a long time to mature. So I also looked at some of the areas that were unseeded but directly adjacent to the seeded areas to see if some of those seeds had created some type of uh, border, um, like help or whatever, but that doesn't seem like it's the case. You can see the area that was completely unseeded and far away from any of the seeded areas and the area that was unseeded but directly adjacent, um, there's really not that much of a difference in the amount of native species that were established. 
Um, but the seeding that was done was done nine years prior to when I did this, um, these surveys. And this is the actual seedling abundance. And so you can tell that the abundance of seedlings, this was done in the, in the fall, is significantly higher still, even after nine years of that seeding event, than in those areas that were never seeded with any type of natives or anything. So then I looked at the soil. I wanted to see how the soil um, was dictating some of these things. Um, because, like I said, the soil that was coming in to fill the quarries was not necessarily from the nature center. It's from different areas all around Fort Worth. What's happening is they're bringing in lower quality fill um, that goes in the bottom of the pits. And what the nature center does before they put that in is they scrape all the good stuff off the top and then they put that good stuff back on top um, as like a little happy topsoil layer to try to, um, to, try to you know, get some of the, the seed bank there and everything. Um, but I wanted to know what type of soil was the city of Fort Worth giving them and, and how did that affect the plant community? So this is soil PCA. And basically what it does is it takes all the different characteristics that I looked at, which was like all these nutrients and texture and everything, and kind of condenses it down to one thing that, that the human brain can't really do so well. So each dot is um, soil that I took from the different pastures. And then over here, these are the different um, management practices that happened on the pastures. So first I want to talk about the little lime green very closely grouped area up there, that's our native prairie. So um, the soils of the native prairies are really similar and they associated with um, high calcium, high silt. If you can see that sort of this axis, the, um, the x-axis correlates a lot with texture, whereas the y-axis correlates more with um, the nutrient levels. So um, you can see that the, the native ones that have these nice native communities, plant communities, do have different soil structure. This down here, um, this is the, the deep fill that they're putting in the very bottom of these pits. And it was very high, high pH, high magnesium, you know, um, high salts, things like that. So it had a, a lot of these nutrients in it. And um, so that's what they're putting deep down on the bottom of the pits and the depth of the, the topsoil layer can be very different um, depending on which exact quarry little area you go to. So whether or not the roots of these plants are reaching the soil is kind of a, a mystery, really. <clears throat> but I wanna talk about these areas here, let's see. These here, these purple ones that are so far apart, those are, um, ones that were quarried and then never filled. So these, this is soil from the bottom of the quarry pit after it's been sitting there for 45 years or so. So you've already got a plant community coming back in. It's not just like bare rock or, or anything like that. There is soil. Um, but I think that they're so different here because you can see that um, they probably just dug to, to different layers in the soil. So they might have dug to a different layer and that's why it's so different at the bottom of these pits. But this one here, this is the pasture or the, the quarry area that I looked at that had the greatest little blue stem concentration. And it's right here next to um, the areas of the native prairies that I looked at. So that shows that the soil really does um, have some type of effect on the plant community that is there. Um, some of these other ones, like this is the areas that were recently filled. They're kind of somewhere in the middle. So uh, they might be you know, good or maybe, I'm not sure, you know, with, with soil, you're not sure exactly is the, you know, which one's affecting which, right? So is it that the plant community has changed this soil um, because the little blue stem came in and it's changing it this way? Or did the little blue stem come in more because the soil was already close to what the, you know, what their native conditions were? So that's kind of the mystery involved there. Um, these over here, these are the ones that were filled nine years ago and they seem to be very sandy. So, after 45 years of just passive reclamation, this is after those agricultural disturbances that had happened in the past, um, the species richness was really similar to these native prairies. Um, the species that were there are really similar. Um, the little blue stem, although slightly lower than those native areas, was, was getting there. 
Um, so it seemed like to me that the time that elapsed since disturbance really had a lot to do with the little blue stem. Um, but of course it only works if you're within a proximity to a native source. If you're trying to restore an area that doesn't have any native species around it, this is just isn't going to work for you. Luckily the Nature Center has a lot of small little pockets that, that were not disturbed. When it comes to active reclamation, obviously the seeding and planting really accelerates um, the growth of those desirable species. But once again, you have the problem of you can only get certain seeds or the ecotype may, may be different than where you're at. Um, and you're artificially creating a community, right? Which might not be as good as the native community that might come in there. But the seeding and planting did really um, mitigate some of those negative effects that the that this filling did. A lot of the filling brought in a lot of invasive species. And when they seeded it, at least it kind of brought in some, some more natives to compete with those invasive species. Um, I think, for my recommendation for the Forest Nature Center, their best bet is just to use green hay. Because they've already got areas that have a plant community that they like, that they want, and it's the native ecotypes because it's right there on the same property, you know, however many feet away. So if they would just um, hay those and then put the green hay directly on top of the, the quarries, then you've got all the propagules um, that you want. Um, so you can get to, they can get back to that target prairie that they, um, that they like. On the little blue stem establishment though, I'm not really sure if you can accelerate it that much. What it looks like from all of the um, data that I've gotten is native species in general, you can accelerate it with seeding and planting, but when it comes to little blue stem, it takes time. And of course, that's the nature of little blue stem. Um, the seeds, not, they're not that viable um, a lot, and of course, it wants to do clonal development. So what you see is, you'll actually see the quarry area that was quarried out, filled, and you'll see next to it, like the little population of little blue stem, and it's coming in, but it's coming in slowly. Um, so I think that time really is a factor when it comes to little blue stem establishment. But the soil does matter too. I wanna to point to this photo over here. You see these green arrows. Those bands of vegetation that you can see are little blue stem. So what it is, is in between those bands are limestone seeps, like limestone escarpments or whatever you call them. So basically what's happening is um, these areas have the higher calcium levels, these bands, and then the little blue stem is pretty much like just really dominant in those higher calcium areas. So soil obviously does have a lot to do with where the blue, little blue stem establishes, not just vice versa. I also want to just show you, this is the difference between the two. Um, ones that were filled in about nine years ago, 10 years ago, maybe now. So this is the area that was seeded and planted. You can see a lot more just heterogeny and it's really different. This is the area that was not seeded and planted at all and it's pretty much an entire field of Bermuda grass. Um, so there are definitely good, good things that come from the seeding and planting. When it comes to quarry um, reclamation, just in general on the quarries, um, I would say that if they've been left for a while and you've already got the native community coming back in, don't fill it unless you have to. Because what's happening is these things have been left for, you know, whatever, 45 years or so. This native community has come from the top over the side and you know, coming on in. But then they come in and they're, um, they're wanting to fill them because of topography. They want to make trails and things like that for people. That's what they do. They have hiking trails in, in native environments. And so, of course, they probably don't want a hiking trail going through a giant pit in the ground. It's probably pretty um, dangerous. But if you don't care about the pit in the ground, I think it is best to just go ahead and leave it because those communities will naturally go ahead and come in there on their own. And of course, that also matters how far down it was quarried. If you're quarried all the way down to like bedrock, it's probably going to take a while before those soils can come back in. These were not quarried all the way down to bedrock. There, there was still soil down there, just not topsoil. Um, but also, if you are going to fill it, the quality of fill, fill matters. Um, Rob doesn't really have that much of control over what the city of Fort Worth puts in the bottom of these things. And um, as a result, there are uh, invasive propagules coming in. There's the, um, some Arundo that's coming in, there's the Johnson grass, and there's the Bermuda grass, and those are like the main problems there. And you can tell 
there's really not that much Bermuda grass in the nature center until you get to these one areas that have been filled with this, you know, unknown fill, and then it's, it's Bermuda everywhere. So those are definitely coming in from those fill. Um, when you do fill them, I think it's best to reduce disturbance. Like I said, you can see here, this is a filled area. All this is Bermuda, all this is Bermuda. Here is literally the line of Little Blue Stem. That's literally the line where they put the trucks in and filled right here. So if you decrease the amount of disturbance that you do whenever you're filling, like don't let the trucks go on the areas that do have nice, you know, these nice communities, they will be able to come in and spread out. You can see that already this little blue stem is spreading out into the Bermuda. Um, but this is an area that I clipped for another part of the experiment. You can tell the Bermuda is thick. I mean, it's thick. Um, so it can be really hard for, for things to come in. Here's what the bottom of the pits look like. So you can see this little blue stem that was all on the side is coming over and just flowing down right back into the pit and creating that community again. Um. So I like to acknowledge Dr. Laura Goff and then uh, Rob and Michelle from the Nature Center, also Suzanne Tuttle. Um, they've all been wonderful in hosting all of my research that I've done. And then I had a lot of great assistants in the field that helped me do really unpleasant things like clip grass and get soil out of the ground when it was really hard. So um, I'm very thankful for them. Now I'll take any questions. Yes. In uh, your first graph, uh -huh. it looked like the, the soil amendments did a pretty good job as far as keeping the invasives out and letting the natives Yes. Control. So would you suggest uh, doing a, a, I mean, for economic sake, doing a soil amendment with different? Yes. I think a lot more research needs to be done about what type of soil amendments and like, concentration and things like that. But yeah, I think, see, that area, it wasn't filled. And there's really, I mean, it was in the middle of a, a, you know, a wooded kind of area. So there was no invasive propagules to come in, really, you know. So once they added those soil amendments and just left it for 35 years, it seemed to do great. It seemed to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the same plot, Heather, uh, it had higher native species diversity than your native prairies in the Q35 SA. Hold on, let me go back to it. Here? Yeah. Did you look Here. at your population in there and ask how many of those are early and mid-successional versus late-successional species? Yes, I did. See, that's an interesting question. It is. So those 35-year ones, those are the great late successional species. But if you look at um, like this one right here that was filled like the three years ago, all those native species are a lot of like... Um, peas, you know, like the pea family and things like that. Those, there's early successional things. You'll have a lot of like um, Illinois bundle flower, you know, and things like that. Ragweed, broomweed, you know. The soil builders. Right, exactly. The natives that are maybe not so desirable, but are there for a good reason. Yeah. yeah. That's why they're early successional plants. That's their job. Exactly. That is their job. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of people try to do things to accelerate the process, which is fine. And I understand not everybody has 45 years to wait around for that little blue stem to come back. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it does do a whole lot better, I think, when you just go ahead and wait it out and, you know, let it do what it wants. On the, the, the unfilled ones, you had mm -hmm. the, two, the split in the... Oh, on the soil? Yeah, on the soil. Mm -hmm. One back. Yeah, you've got the, one, the group on the left and the group on the right. That's kind of a difference in texture, is that correct? Yes, that, um, that is a more... Dish, so you, over here is clay, clay and silt. Say, have you looked at this the is sandy. Well, these two areas were actually really close to each other, but no, I didn't really look them. Make any difference? They can be five feet right. away from each other. Well, and like I said, these pits are different depths. I mean, some of them are way, you know, they dug further down than others, you know, and I'm sure that's based on whatever gravel they found or whatever they found that they were taking out. But yeah, I think that that does but probably matter. Looking, but if you go back and look at the geology, you'll be able to get a better feel for what soil you're going to get from it based on the, the chemistry of the rocks, and that could help yeah. guide you. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah? How do you uh, suppress the uh, Johnson grass? Does, does it take over the blue stem? Or? 
that's like a age old question, right? I mean, <laughs> everybody tries to, yeah. Um, I don't know. In, any, in all of these areas that I saw that had Johnson grass, it was pretty much taking over. The Johnson, Johnson grass was taking over. Mm -hmm. yeah. So any, any of the areas that I saw that were previously quarried that had that Johnson grass coming in, the little blue stem was not coming in. Yeah. So. What, what do you recommend? Uh, oh gosh, I don't know. They, there's a lot of recommendations out there. I don't know exactly personally what works, but you, you hear a lot of things, you know. Yeah, burn and then mow at certain times and things like that, or till it before the winter so that the rhizomes freeze when they're on top of the soil. But I don't know if that really works in Texas because it doesn't freeze that much. So, yeah, not in Fort Worth either that much. So, where, where is the Institute of Texas? You, that's where you oh, the Botanical Research Institute of Texas is in Fort Worth, right in the cultural district, right downtown next to the stockyards. Research Institute of Texas. Yeah, it's on the same um, grounds as our botanical gardens in Fort Worth. Across the street from the zoo. Yeah, right across the street from the Fort Worth Zoo. Across that is. Down the street from my favorite university. Oh yeah, TCU. Yep, and we partner with TCU a lot. They let us use their facilities and things like that, which is great. Okay. Did you eat any today and am these solitaires? Yes. Um, no. Okay. Was there a reason for not doing that? Money. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> a prairie would need more NH4 than NO3. So I would think that would need to influence some of that. I don't know. You might be right. They had suites of soil tests that were available, and I did the ones well, that I, I could afford. Other labs, oh, other labs. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I didn't look at other labs. Okay, no one else? Any Thank you. Any questions? No. We've got a, a minute or two. If not, uh, another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.